off field, when I was on field, life was great. Um, mm. You know, we talk about finding our escapes in life and, you know, me playing sport was my escape. Um, it was the only place that I felt safe and felt I belonged. Okay, everybody, welcome to another episode of the One Shot Movement podcast where we talk all things entrepreneur, business, inspiring stories. And I'm super excited today because we've got a very, very special guest, Mr. Lance Pacioni, who has had an incredible journey to date. And I'm looking forward to talking to him more about that. But just a bit about Lance he was a professional Aussie rules footballer playing at the highest level. Played just under 100 games of football and a great career there. But where his story took a turn, and we're going to talk about that, his life after football and his journey is quite inspiring. And now he's the founder of an incredible foundation called Love Me, Love You. So welcome, Lance. Thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, having a bit more of a chat. Uh, just start off, I, I guess we'll probably start with a bit about your backstory, so people get to know you more and then we'll break it all down, so oh, big, what about... Big, big backstory, mate. <laughs> so big if you want to just yeah, dive into you know footy career, oh. if there's something important, even in child, whatever it is, just oh, go Oh, right, everything. Mate, we, uh, like every other kid, you know, growing up, uh, the sport was my thing, uh, and I love sport, and I come from a sporting background, my dad was a uh, soccer root, a former soccer root, so, um, so not a former one, he's still you know, classified as a soccer route. Um, so sporting was our thing. I started playing basketball when I was, since I was four years of age. Um, I was an overdeveloped Eastern European kid. So even though I was four, I looked like I was about nine. Um, you know, but sport was my thing. I have a brother and a sister who I'm very close with and, you know, we sort of grew up, you know, playing sports and doing our thing together. And mum and dad, um, we were very lucky that um, mum and dad showed a Great work, great work ethic, and, and sort of led the way of our life to um, understand what work ethic is all about, and how do we make sure that comes through. Um, you know, but, you know, the footy was my thing, basketball was my, my thing until I realised I wasn't going to grow when I, when, I, yeah. when I was after I was twelve years of age. Um, but you know, then, and then footy became my, my thing. But I was very lucky to um, go to a really good school as well. I went to Essendon Grammar, that pegged out there, and then. Um, you know, from grade six and, you know, from the background that we had, you know, my, my parents weren't wealthy at all and, and there's no right, um, no right reason that I was actually able to go to a school like that uh, due to the school fees. Um, mm -hmm. But my parents worked their, their bums off and dad worked double jobs and they made sure it was available to me to have a, a great education. Um, you know, that's uh, my challenges of my life, um, dealing with a whole range of social issues and um, we'll say from, from school, um, not fitting in and not being um, my best possible version of me. Um, you know, cr and that started from primary school right through to you know, high school and even, even, even when I was playing footy. Um, you know, but I, uh, you know, I was very grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful, more grateful now that I had the opportunity than I was at the time. But you know, life was um, also pretty tricky uh, inside my head. Uh, I um, had a whole range of anxiety issues uh, which sort of pronounced themselves um, when I was in high school. Um, off field, when I was on field, life was great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we talk about finding our escapes in life and you know, me playing sport was my escape. Um, it was the only place that I felt safe and felt I belonged. And, you know, I was uh, from, right from a, a junior age, I was, you know, um, winning national awards and state captains and all these sorts of things for footy. and. Um, but moving through with that, as I said, off field, um, there was a whole range of issues that I wasn't knowing, wasn't knowing how, to, how to have the conversations about it, how to talk about what's going on in life. And, you know, the conversations about, you know, if I had to say to you 25 years ago, anxiety, mm -hmm. you would have to look it up in the dictionary probably, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, I understand the difference between being anxious and actually having anxiety, and, you know, but an unknown, um, conversations around that and the resource or the education around that was not knowing how to deal with it. Mm. Um, but as I said, because I played footy, life was okay. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I was training pretty much every night. I was playing two games a weekend and life was really good. Um, and because I was playing footy and you know, this is the world that we live in, especially in Melbourne, um, you know, if you're a footballer at school and you're still getting in trouble, you're, t 
I was all okay. Yeah, everyone just was, oh, no, he's just the football guy. So I just leave him alone. Um, but, you know, moving through that, and then, you know, I was not very lucky to play AFL for a long time. Mm. Um, you know, I played eight years on, I was on the list for eight years, and I had a great couple of years off field more than on field when I was in Adelaide. And I first got drafted to Adelaide Crows. Um, you know, I was there in an era, their, their golden era. Um, mm. And so I was there in 98 when they came way back to back in their premiership years. So, you know, and, and you know, staring the locker next door to uh, Darren Jarman mm-hmm. uh, was just something that you just dream about as a kid and thinking, mm-hmm. what's going on here? And, um, but as I said, I was more, I was better off field than I was on field at that stage. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, and then it continued on and went to Hawthorne, which was very lucky to be the same thing, you know. Walking into a locker room with folks like Shane Crawford and Paul Salmon and these guys in the world, mm-hmm. it was amazing. And then uh, at North Melbourne, and, and then we all got a bit hazy after that, that's for sure. And, and uh, I guess, yeah, you had a great career, like, you know, anyone that plays at the highest level in front of, a, you know, 100,000 people sometimes, you know, that you think life is great and everything is great. But, you know, your, I guess, the transition from football to where you are now, you know, that's... Yeah, it's a real hazy story. Um, it's about understanding that when you're in a professional atmosphere, and like when I first started AFL, it wasn't, you know, we were training first like six o'clock in the morning, guys are going to work and then coming back, you know, to train at five o'clock at night. That was, that was what it was. Um, so when I was playing, it was really transitioning into that professional full-time um, atmosphere. And then, but I got really nice with that, you know, because the structure with it, and we all, we all respond well to structure and having that sort of, un, um, sort of confidence in knowing what we're going to do, when we need to do it and how that works. Um, but then when you lose that structure, um, some guys really enjoy the freedom mm. and some guys really take advantage of the freedom as well. Yeah. Um, or all girls, no matter what, who they are. Um, for me, my issue became that because when I, my mental health issues that I had, so yeah, depression, when we trace it back, my depression um, reared its ugly head um, in my early 20s. Um, you know, from a whole range of things that were going more sort of around footy based sort of stuff. Um, you know, performing injuries and mm-hmm. not fitting in and doing all that. And that was just sort of really getting some real dark moments in my life. And, you know, my grandpa died, I didn't well, deal well with the grief there. Um, and then alcohol became my friend. You know, mm-hmm. And it was, it was a real, real close friend of mine. Um, yeah. Not so much during the week as opposed to um, I need alcohol at night, but when I put myself in a position that binge drinking was messy, yeah. really, really messy. And, and then post footy, time, money, trying to find that escape, chasing that dragon, as people keep talking about, um, you know, trying to find that high. I, I found my high not in um, achieving in sport. Uh, I found that high um, in, in the party. Yeah. And, and it was pretty, um, got really out of control really quickly. Mm. Um, I was doing some wrong things, and I was, you know, just self-destructive behaviours around that. But because I thought if I come, if I get to myself in a position that I, I'm down, I'm not, I don't know how to get myself back up. Yeah. And that was through um, through the substances. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, the same thing. I, I was, I was really, you know, really high functioning drug addict. We'll call it. Yeah. Um, you know, I was a PT in the city for a long time uh, post footy. So when I was about 26, 27, I started. Um, PT in the city and it's quite come quite successful really quickly. Mm. I think it was the same thing because I played footy. People wanted to train yep. with the footy guy, That's, you know. Um, so that was my life, and but you know I was using pretty much daily you know, yep. for a long time in my life, and, and you know lost some good friends out of that, and mm. um, you know then brought us to a position that uh, nearly eight years ago, um, the sequence of, of experiences through that year in two thousand and eleven. It brought me to a stage where I am um, really suicidal and thought, mm. this is not where life's at. Yeah. Um, it was a very lucky for me that I'm able to be able to share that story and be able to share the mm. idea around, um, you know, it's breaking that stigma around that and talking about storytelling uh, a lot and, and how you share that story and how people connect to, to that ability of what someone's story is. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the issue that we have with storytelling also on the other side of it is that people sometimes don't want to share their story because they don't think it's worthy of sharing. Yeah. But everyone's got a story, everyone's mm. got a journey, everyone's been through challenges, everyone's been through some success. 
you know, I spent through some great family times, everyone's had some not so great family times, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's how we share those stories to the people that we um that we care for and we surround ourselves with and make it and make it work. And you know, for me now, um, you know, I, I love sharing that story. You know, I'm mm -hmm. very I'm not regretful of the fact of being able to share it. I'm regretful of some of the decisions I have made over time um, that put me in those positions. Um, mm -hmm. But at the time, that I thought they were the best choices for what I was doing because that's what you do. You know, mm -hmm. you don't go into it thinking, oh, this is a terrible choice. I'm going to do this <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and see if this lands me. Um, you know, I nearly lost my leg now uh, a few months before and was all signed from a foot injury and infections that were coming from that. So there's a whole range of things, you know, the alcohol and drugs went up at another level. Mm. Um, you know, and I was just dealing with some, with some pretty wrong dudes at the time. Yeah, and, and it's a common story too. Like you're now mm -hmm. inspiring people with what you're doing and we're going to move into that in a little bit. But just, uh, I guess, you know, was there an actual defining moment when you made that decision to go, I've got to change something here or was it I, I know a good friend of ours Matt Pilios you yeah. know he you know he, he was talking on this show about dealing with some mental health issues himself at a period of time and you know I guess for me even my own story with losing Ethan stillborn and that was like a, a point in life where I, I become a different person yeah. from that moment on mm -hmm. um, how would you describe that yourself for me I think it was that moment where I was, so I was sitting on a roof, it was just in a, uh, a house that we were living at at the time um, in East Kiowa, but it was a big three story house for me. Um, not two stories, but you know, it's up high, high enough to do some damage if it was going to happen. Um, I found myself in a position, I hadn't slept for a few days, um, and the hallucinations and everything had come from it. And you know, I got down, it was about three hours I was up on that roof, so it was some pretty intense thinking and mm. thoughts that were going through at the time. And, um, my light bulb moment was just the conversation of care that I had with my wife at yeah. the time. Um, the mom was still my wife, which was my girlfriend at the time. Um, you know, that conversation of care that she showed and gave and wasn't, she didn't, you know, um, reinvent the wheel with what she said or anything like that. It was mm. just that genuine uh, care. And I had that as well, you know, and I genuinely had that care and support from some amazing people in my life, namely my mum, um, you know, to make sure that I was okay. But mm. at the time when I was getting the help and support from my mum, I didn't really want it either. Yeah. The, the, the beast that was inside my head. And, but at that time I was like, okay, and then I got the help that I needed. I put the plan in place. How am I gonna make this work? Because I had two choices, either to get better or I'll keep going down the same road and I'll be dead. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and we talk about being the same person. I just believe I'm the same person, but the the action of me as a person was a lot different yeah. to what it is now. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of care. I had a lot of empathy for people. I always like to make people feel good about themselves. Like we all, you know, within, within mm -hmm. reason. And, um, you know, but I, I better understand my system now for, for me and how I make me work. Mm. which is the most important thing for me to understand is that how I make me work and how I make me work for the best possible version of me and so that then the other people around my life can have that positive impact and have the better the better impact on what that life is and um, you know you talk about inspiration you, you dropped that word in there before that I have this really tricky one around inspiration I think inspiration is um, a very uh, nice fluffy word that people use and we really understand mm. it but Inspiration in life like that, mm. yeah. It's how do we find the motivation for those people? And that's, mm. and that's the thing that we need to help people understand because motivation gives you a, a greater purpose of where you want to go and what you want to be. And inspiration is, uh, you know, I've lost, I've lost that feeling by the time I walk out of the stadium. You yeah. Know? Um, you know, but we, we need that inspiration because it gives that connection to what your motivation can be. But, mm. you know, for me, my motivation is to, um, in my life, is to get the best out of myself every single day. Mm. Um, because, you know, as you know from the experiences that you've had, that life's really short. Mm. Um, and people keep saying that, but, you know, don't think about what life will be over an 80 year period, which is to think about what life is now and what you're making to work now, because you just don't know what tomorrow will be, mm. um, which is a scary thing in life. But um, if you keep thinking about 
um, yeah, finishing, you, you forgot about actually living it. You know? yeah. yeah. And I guess, you know, like from that point, um, when you say there, to starting a foundation, yeah. which like there must have been an no, interesting time. There. Interesting time, ridiculous. So, and it happened really quick. It happened really, really quick. So, I um, I put a plan. Anyway, so I got my help that I needed. The psych psychology psychiatrist help. Sorry, um, and the help from my people around me yeah, and my trusted people that I um who were there for me at the time and really showed that sort of um, support and empathy for like the situation. Um, I four months after I went clean, I um gathered my my people together and said I want to do this. I, I yeah. want to. Firstly, it was just going to be the, the walk from Sydney to Melbourne. Um, yeah. You know, because walking became my medication, became my escape. Yeah. You know, just getting out there and running the streets and doing my thing. Mm. Um, and then uh, you know, from from that moment, so that was May two thousand and twelve. We had that first meeting of what, what we want to do, but. It's amazing what you do when you're not um, influenced by substances or alcohol or mm. these sorts of things. You, you open yourself up to these opportunities to be able to do something. And um, had that first meeting with the, the crew, as I said, Matt Kudos being my own, a good mate of ours, uh, Luke Livingston mm. as well. Uh, had my mum, uh, Dutchie was in there that first meeting. Um, mm. Yeah, and then I said, all right, well, and then we, um, I put all the work in place and did all the research and know what I wanted to do and got it done. And um, January 2013, we, um, we became a, a legal charity. Um, yeah. You know, we had all the statuses and all the things and everything yeah. that comes with being a charity. And, you know, just to think that that was about 14 months after I made suicide, I thought, well, that's, mm. you, know, that's you know, but I was very lucky that I had those people around me to be able to do that. And, um, you know, then we put their plan in place and made it all work. And then in 2014, we launched. Yeah. And, you know, a good, good 12, 13 months after we became an entity, we actually launched to the mm. world um, properly um, with that walk from the city to Melbourne. So, yeah. um, and now, you know, we get to impact thousands and thousands of people's lives um, all the time. And, you know, we're very appreciative and grateful of the opportunities that we have from our community people, from our um, you know, people in the workplaces, mm. our sponsors, you know, people that give us grants to be able to educate more people, um, mm. people that participate in our walk, and our ride, our, yeah. you know, every, everything. And, you know, but in the essence, we look at it also that it allows me to be what I want to be in life and, and that is a, as a dad. Yeah. You know, it gives me a great opportunity to... Um, to make my life um, really beautiful with my mm. wife and, and my, my two boys and um, surrounding myself with those people, you, you know, it might get me to out of bed every day because, mm. um, you know, it puts me to bed at night with a smile on my face. And, and before we talk more about the foundation, because I really want to talk about that and mental health and statistics to bring that to life, like your yeah. girlfriend at the time, now wife, living through your situation too, that must have been an in incredible um, rock for you. <laughs> incredible, incredible rock. Um, the, she's taught me a lot, you know, taught me a lot about um, just how, just treating people and being people and, and, mm. and making sure that you're true to yourself and, and how that works. And, um, you know, there, there's certain people in this world that are born to be a, a, a rock. Mm. Yeah, um, some you're really good at, but, at the same time, my wife has an amazing, um, uh, amazing resilience ability as well. So she has a range of issue, uh, challenges and um, issues that she's experienced from a, from a young girl to to up uh, it is now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know the, the mental health challenges that she's been through as well. So you know, it was just something that it's not too. Um, as I said before, it's not just because it's not a, a, a such a tragic story to tell, but mm. it's, it's still a level of importance that you need to be able to tell that story. And for her to tell that and share that with the people around her uh, is amazing. But her as a rock for myself and my two boys, um, you know, and, and all the people that come into contact with her, mm. you know, I'm very lucky. I count my, my, uh, my, my, my lucky stars every night and make sure, and, you know, but the best way I can repay her through that um, is just doing what I need to do and, mm. and doing what we can do with um, the foundation, first of all, and, and as I said, and more importantly, as a, as a father. Yeah. Um, you know, because in the, in, in the reality of life, the most important thing about life is your family mm. um, and, making it, and making it work and having those 
amazing experiences um, and making sure that when you know when she hits the fan mm. um, that you, you've got that foundation of care and support around you to make sure you're all, you're all good yeah and, and you said originally the vision was just this walk from sydney to melbourne <laughs> it's evolved <laughs> into something quite considerable because yeah. I, I do want people when we post this i want people to you know, check out your foundation yeah. and your walk and your initiatives and everything like that. Do you want to just share where it's evolved to? Oh, wow. So, with the, we said the initial idea was that I was going to do that, that walk from Sydney to Melbourne. I was going to do that every year when we were going to raise money for, you know, for, you know, just for mental health support and, and awareness. And, um, you know, and Maddie and, and the guys and everybody said to me, you know, there's more to what we can do. Uh, and we can make a difference. Um, you know, and, and to think, even when we launched in 2014, um, there wasn't mental health. You know, Beyond Blue was the one, mm. you know, headspaces are around. Um, there's a whole range of bigger organisations, but in terms of the community level organisations, there wasn't a, health, wasn't a lot going on mm. in that space. So we found a real um, point of difference of what we could deliver and how we could make it work. And, you know, I was very lucky um, that I had an amazing mentor through that experience, um, a mate, lady called Maddie Clement, who's now the Director of Wellbeing I mean, um, for the Australian Institute of Sport. So, oh, yeah. someone that knows what they're doing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and still to today, I'm in very good contact with her just to, you know, just to chew the fat and make sure we're doing the right things in our space. And we're very lucky um, to have that relationship. And, you know, but now we, we deliver, we were, we were first targeted, our demographic we were targeting at that stage was um, people 15 to 30, 15 to 30 men and women, um, more through the highest to the higher, higher end of high school and through sports clubs because mm. of our history and my background with, with footy clubs. Um, we found a real sort of um, a need to help educate people in their sports clubs in an environment where we, um, where we feel safest. Mm. Um, but now our programs uh, are tailored specifically uh, right through from kids in prep, um, right through, and now I've done some sessions and experiences with uh, people at Rotary groups and you know, mm. people in their 80s talking about the same thing. Um, and, and we go through the, the same step, talk about awareness, acknowledgement and action, talk about understanding of how, what support is, how do you engage in your support networks. And the re reality of our difference is that we, we're not trying to fluff people through Look how amazing this life could be, and blah, blah, blah. we know that, that, that the challenges hit, mm. and they hit real hard. Mm. Um, but how do we, we're becoming in a society now that we've complicated a lot of things, complicated a lot, and complicated the ability to have a conversation. Mm. Even. Um, so what we're trying to do with our programs, um, you know, even through our campaigns, our events, is just simplify the process for people. Mm. Help you understand what it is that you can be doing for yourself. How do you lay those foundations of self-care? How do you make sure that you're doing the right thing for you every single day? Mm. Not just thinking, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. Yeah. You know, how do you become accountable to that sort of process? And, um, you know, because people, the longer you leave something, the worse it's going to get, mm. or the, the larger the impact that it's going to have on your life, yeah. um, not in a positive way either. Um, so we're really appreciative of what we can do. You know, our, we're, we're mainly based in Victoria at this stage, but we have, um, you know, run, uh, run on the programs and organisations through the east coast of Australia. Mm. We're very lucky that we have a, um, our board now is is uh, of the highest of levels. Um, mm. It's an amazing, you know, experience business wise um, connections and networks that, these, that our board has. Mm. Um, we have you know, seven of us in the office now. We're doing wow. a whole range of things. We've got the corporate impact manager, uh, community impact manager, and then we have digital. Uh, we have a support pathway program. We have a youth manager. Uh, a guy regional does all our regional work now, um, so we call him Farmer Lance. Um, so he looks like me, but farmer. Uh, <laughs> um, unlucky for him. Um, but you know, and then uh, you know, we've got events people. We've got a range of people that uh, you know, volunteer wise, we go through the roof. Mm. Um, you know, but you sort of walk into a, the office every single day and just appreciate the fact that um, we can do what we do. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a range of facilitators and you know corporate programs that we're able to deliver. Our partnerships, um, some of our program partnerships will take us across uh, all around Australia um, over the next couple of years, which we're really excited about. 
you know, we're going into a digital space now because you have to, because 2020, yeah. you're not doing anything digitally, you're uh, being left behind. Um, but it's what we have to understand with that is that we we have a real focus on being a, a blended delivery program. Um, yeah. So we're, people need face to face. You know, mm. us as humans, we thrive off the face to face connection and, and the energy between people, and people need that. Mm. Um, and as much as we say we need to be digital, we need to be technologically based with what we can do, um, people still need this. Mm. You know, so. Um, so we'll have an element, a high percentage stuff of our, our programs and delivery will be through um, a face-to-face -face ability. Um, but also the issue with that is that when you leave, what happens? Mm. Um, you know, in our presentation, people take in about 5 to 10% of actually what's said. Mm. So how do you make sure that that sort of um, education and resource and support is an ongoing thing? So, you know, we're putting a big investment into making sure that we can make sure that, you know, we do have a lifetime of well-being. And that's mm. what our programs are around. So how do people engage in a lifetime of well-being? Um, not just start doing things and something goes bad. Yeah. yeah. And um, I guess mental health is a broad word. A broad um, word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, like, you know, just for the audience to understand a little bit about it, what's some statistics that would just shock people? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I'd say 100% of us know someone that's going through a mental health challenge. Wow. There you go. Uh, you, you have to. If you, if you don't know somebody, you're very, very lucky. Um, yep. um, you know, uh, one in five are, are experiencing a high level diagnosed mental illness. In the case of the difference between what we have, there's a difference between a mental health challenge, which is normal things that people go through, you know, mm. and understanding stressful experiences or there's some events or things that are traumatic experiences or events that have been through and it becomes a challenge. Um, as opposed to when people are actually living with a diagnosed mental illness. Okay. Um, you know, the suicide rate that is linked to a, a whole range of mental illness um, and mental health challenges uh, is through the roof. You know, it's it, it, it actually decreased in the last report um, by about 200, which is what they're saying. Um, yeah, but it's on average going about 3,000 suicides reported every year in Australia. And mm -hmm. Across the world, there's about 800,000 suicides every year. Wow. Um, so it's one person every 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. So if you want to damage that, what is, is doing to our, our lives is that a person dies every 40 seconds from suicide, which is reported. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can go from zero to hero if you do put the investment in, um, but you can go from hero to zero like that, mm. um, which is the challenges that we have a part of our life. But it's just you know, engaging those conversations to make sure that um, we, don't, we don't feel alone mm. in, in being able to share and being able to understand our story and what our journey looks like. And you know, there's a whole range of people going through a whole range of, um, whole range of crap that um, mm. nobody wants to talk about either. Yeah. Um, but you know, one in six kids will be diagnosed with an anxiety issue for, you know, under 15 years of age. Like, mm. You know, we're dealing with, you know, there's kids that have been reported um, uh, suicide in, uh, you know, as young as eight, seven, eight years of age. Well, that's, that's scary. You know, there's a whole range of things and usually linked to bullying mm. um, and, and building rife in school and community and workplaces. You know, mm. judgment that comes from being who you think, um, how you think you, your actions uh, are making you feel better about mm. what you're putting onto other people, but it's not. Mm. Um, you know, this, this, the, the technology world of you know, cyberbullying, mm. people worry is, is causing a huge effect on their kids as well. Um, you know, as parents, it's becoming quite a scary um, space to deal with, you know, mm. to live in, because as much as we all think we're technologically advanced in what we do and how we go about it, um, the kids are actually, you know, they're three steps ahead. Yeah. They're, they're, they're above it, you know. Um, you know, and the accessibility of information, the accessibility to connect with people through through all different platforms. Um, you can put up as many firewalls as you want and they'll find a way around it. And, you know, these kids are amazing uh, in their ability to, to process it and do it and be it. Um, but it also puts them in dangerous positions, mm. um, you know, unsafe positions. So, you know, fifth leading, you know, suicide and leading cause of death between the ages of 15 to 44 in Australia. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there's a high spike between um, the ages of 18 to 30, is a, is a lot. Um, three quarters of the suicides that happen are, are male. 
Mm. She was not so really, um, sort of not my eyes awards were like we're proud of winning. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but there's the, the last one I'll leave you with is on average there's about 180 suicide attempts per day. Wow. Per day. So it's about 65,000 a year wow. on average plus. So, you know, the, uh, and people still don't believe um, that mental illness is real and they still don't believe mm. uh, why it's all suicide. Um, but the more comments I did, you know, like tonight, um, I said, I've got to go. Which is one of those the sad parts of my my um, my role. Uh, you know, love we love you, and what we do is that I've got to go to speak to a um, after suicide support group um, mm. tonight. So our members uh, are part of this group um, have lost someone to suicide. So I'm, I, I've got to go and speak to these people and make sure, and hopefully make sure that you know they have a, a connection to why it may have happened. Um, we'll never have the answers because you'll never understand fully. Of why mm. people go down that space, you know, that thing. Um, you know, but you know, knowing by my my presence being there and all the other organisations that are doing amazing work in this space and, and allowing people to connect into a reality that we're all here together and and these things and sometimes you know, most of the time um, we can't do nothing about. Mm. Um, hopefully, we 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 caught we stop the situation from getting to it to that point. Um, early, um, so early intervention is obviously an amazing thing if we can do it. Um, but it's, how do we educate those people to make sure that they feel um, like they can have these conversations, how they can actually understand what they need to be doing around their self care, and um, how do they actually embrace the ability of what this life and the opportunities of you know looking at the sky and, and realizing that there's an amazing day out there. And, um, but mental illness is a beast. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, when I'm just listening to all these statistics, there'd be one that probably would be impossible to track, but there's a rapid growth in just the everyday average person with substance abuse in terms of drugs and everything like that. Do you think that that's contributing much to mental health and how... Mental health challenges? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, but that's the chicken or the egg yeah. issue, isn't it? Um, you know, do you, do you go down the substances and alcohol track um, because you get some mental health challenges or do you get your mental health challenges or mental illness because you've gone down a track? Mm. Um, yeah, and it works both ways, I think. Um, the, the issue that we have with alcohol is that it's a socially acceptable thing and, and as a culture, uh, an Australian culture, we um, connect in our ability to have a beer yeah. with somebody, like um, mm. wine to dinner or whatever mm. it might be, which is fine. Which is, I'm not saying there's anything against it because, you know, that's still a good way of connecting with people and it's a, you know, it's a culture thing and, and it's fine, but it's when that people don't know when to stop mm. or they can't um, process their life without stopping. Mm. Um, so, and, and, and realising the negative impact by having too much you know, mm. to do to your system and physically and, and mentally. Mm. Um, you know, substances is so, very, so easily accessible. Mm. So easily accessible. You, you, you can... You can find substances anywhere, yeah. Um, and it's not. And the conversation piece around people that get into drugs, um, from a from society's point of view, it's always thought that it's a low socioeconomic issue. Mm. Um, but it's not. Mm. Um, you know, there's people in in high um, positions in, in business and, and communities that. Um, are drug addicts and they're mm. functioning and they're mm. doing and they're being and, um, and because they're able to function and do and be uh, they don't think it's an issue that they're doing it but, but uh, it's going to come and bite them on the butt yeah um, which it did for me um, at that time you know I had time I had money uh, life was was really good and I thought from from external lens you're looking at my, what my life was um, you thought oh you guys like to party mm. um, but my um, party was in a dark room um, Pretty much every day, yeah. so yeah, and, and so that nearly put, bit me on the bum mm. uh, and really bad. But uh, you know, we, we'll help people understand is that when the choices you're making, you know, it's impacting, and that's not just you know, alcohol and drugs, we're talking about with kids with gaming. Mm. Um, you know, there's a difference between being a gamer, mm. yeah, which you mm. play games and all that sort of stuff, and that's fine, um, and, but as opposed to having like a gaming disorder, okay, yeah, where it's a full addiction to the gaming. Um, and you're not doing the other things that are good 
that are a part of your life and um, you know addiction is something that you looked at is if it's impacting the other parts of your life um, negatively um, no matter how small then that's an issue mm. um, not to say as I said same thing as alcohol it, yeah if it's impacting your life mm. and the people around you we have a job we have an issue yeah um, and yeah, myself well, I, you know, I'll be lucky to have 10 beers a year mm. um, but that's a choice I make for me um, my wife doesn't drink either well, she might go out and um, every blue moon and you know, have, a, have a champagne but um, it doesn't sit well with us in our house we don't have alcohol in our house mm. um, we, we you know when people come over um, we don't present alcohol in the thing but that's a choice that we make mm. um, and you know because for me if I wake up if I go out and have beers and wake up with a hangover, hangover the only two real people that, that matters most that, 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 that will impact is my kids mm. um, you know they want to play with dad they want to do they want to go they want to be and having two boys you can't be off your gut mm. you've got to be on <laughs> you've got to be on all the time from from seven o'clock in the morning when we're very lucky that they wake up um you know it's when they go to bed they are 100 miles an hour 100 uh, percent of the time yeah um, so yeah and just, and just uh, I guess we were, we were having a bit of a chat beforehand, but a really important thing to bring awareness to and love me, love you was really conversational, you know, being able to come out and speak to people like males who yep. often tend to bottle up their issues. And, you know, if I think about my, say, impact and legacy moving forward, talking about losing Ethan, uh, stillborn challenges, like there's not too many males that are, that they'll just battle by themselves. Historically, we're known to bottle things up and push through and just make it work. Mm. Um, because you talked about uh, my wife being a rock for me um, before that we always believe that um, we can't show our vulnerabilities or express that you know, in a way that um, will show that weakness in our system. Mm. Um, because we are such proud Aussies and proud men and, um, you know, but by being able to share that to a real man uh, in this world will understand and be, have that full self-awareness of this is crap that I'm going through. I, I need to get this out uh, mm. because we more we bottle it up. And you talk about the, the, the top, if you have a toxic relationship with an experience that you've had, um, you keep feeding that, top, that toxicity into your system mm. and you're going to pop. Mm. Um, you know, but by being able to share it, you know, my head, when I talk about my life, my, my stature and my life and how I look automatically, um, you know, breaks down those barriers mm. um, and, and being able to open up those vulnerabilities and, and open up to the idea that if I don't reach out for support, I can't be supported. Mm. Like I can't actually allow that support to come to me. Um, and we all need to be supported in our life because if we weren't um, needing of the support or opening ourselves up to support, um, we would isolate ourselves in our shed and think that life was okay. Mm. Um, but, you know, and that's, it's not just a, a male issue, it's not only females, it, it's, it's society's issue. We're, we're, we're facing the challenges with um, the, the preconceived judgment that comes from sharing these challenges or mm. experiences or events that, that are sitting well with us. You know, and we're, we're afraid of judgment and we've become such a comparative society that we're always comparing ourselves to some somebody else mm. and, and why can't I be them or why can't I have that and, mm. uh, as, as opposed to being grateful and mindful of the fact that we have amazing things that are a part of our life and we be our ability to do and uh, the people that are a part of our life as well but um, and don't judge you know because you know who the hell are you to, to judge what I do in my life and how I go about it I'm not saying you specifically. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, when people start throwing judgment out, it, it just it, it nails people. Mm. Um, and and it's, it's not good. It's not positive for society. Our community is being impacted really bad by it. Um, social media has a, has, a, has a big hand in that. Mm. Um, you know, always thinking, okay, I need to be that. But you, all you need to, need to do is be you. Mm. Be your best version of you. Um, and if you can recognise the signs and symptoms around you not being the best version of yourself, if you can recognise that earlier, you're going to be a lot better off. But it's also opening um, 
when you talk about um, uh, males, is, is opening them up to the opportunity to be able to share. Mm. You know, creating a safe enough environment for them to be able to share. Um, don't have to have 12 beers with them and, and have that conversation at 3 a.m., mm. um, which historically has been the, the way in the past. Yeah. Um, but moving with that is, is, is creating that opportunity for them and opening up their eyes to the fact that we all go through it. We all go through some crap, and, mm. and you know, myself in the still to today, I have um, you know a range of uh, challenges that I have uh, socially. You know, I think I'm a very sociable guy, but I have been overwhelming larger experiences with a lot of people. It really gets me, and I and I shut down and I bottle myself out mm. and I don't really like it. And, but I understand it, mm. um, you know, and, and I have um, my better coping mechanisms to understand that as well. Mm. Do you think? Um, and what's your opinion? Obviously, a high level sports person, how do you think or do you in, uh, embrace meditation, for example? Yeah, I, do. I do. I do it a lot. I do it every day, actually. Yeah. Um, I, when, I, when I went clean, I, um, you know, I did a lot of soul searching and finding out who I was and how I was going about life. And you know, I really got into um, I was reading a lot of Buddhism books. Yeah. I was really getting into it. And, uh, you know, and it just teaches me how to be. What I did with that research around that in the readings, I learned how to become mindful while being active. And that was my thing. Um, and in the, and while walking, you know, as opposed to meditation, people always think that meditation um, is sitting in a quiet place, corner, cross legs, mm. under the way. It's yeah. not from, at best. Um, it doesn't have to be done like that. Um, what I like to sort of help with understanding how I do it is, as I said, being active with it. Mm. Okay, and, and I was even so I get up at four o'clock every morning now, yeah. mm. um, six mornings a week, have, have my morning off, <laughs> and because um, my wife just needs to sleep in sometimes, you know. <laughs> um, so I get up at four o'clock every morning, I drive to the gym, and I'll um, meditate for about 15 minutes before yeah. I start actually training. Mm. Um, and I do lay down and just chill, but you know, I get up on a bike and I'll do 40 k's before I start doing some weights and all that sort of stuff, and you know. But being present in that situation, you know, and the next thing I know from start to finish, I've actually forgotten that I was actually on there. It's mm. actually how we become more present in that situation. And, um, you know, a lot of footy clubs now in the professional world, in professional sports, they're doing that. Um, you know, how to become more mindful in our situation, how we slow our thoughts down, not how we stop our thoughts, how we slow our thoughts down, mm. how we slow our process down. Um, and you know, I think for me, it's taken a lot of investment, a lot of time, a lot of energy to be able to do that. And I, even you know, during the day, you know, I'll sit back from my desk and, and just sit in you know, a couple of minutes or bring myself back down and make sure I can make sure I can move forward with it. And you know, even before I go to bed, um, it just helps me with my breathing practices to mm. just like what I call disconnect to reconnect. Mm. Because if I go to bed charged up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have a good sleep, am I? Yeah. And if I don't have a good sleep, I'm not going to have a good day the next day. Yeah. We're all human. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just that reconnecting ability. <laughs>